Hey everyone, before we start the show, I just want to get some plugs out of the way. If you enjoy this podcast and you're into wrestling, check out the Nerds and Marks podcast or Marty and Sarah Love Wrestling. If you're not getting your fill on movie and entertainment discussion, then check out the Entertainment Buffet podcast. If you want to dive into the world of video games, I highly recommend the Dark Cast by my friends over at DarkStation.com. Listen to them cover important topics and interview men and women from all over the industry. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shelved. I am your host, Jeremy Meyer. Um, so this is a episode that I am very excited to cover because I am given the chance to talk about my all-time favorite video game and a favorite movie of mine, all in the same episode. Um, now, this one is going to be about uh, a little video game franchise and movie franchise question mark um called mortal Kombat. um i don't know why i said it so gravelly like that but um mortal Kombat is my all-time favorite video game franchise uh specifically mortal Kombat 2 and mortal Kombat 9 which was like the remake retelling of the first three games on playstation 3 and xbox 360 uh, it's, it's my favorite. I, I love fighting games, and Mortal Kombat is the one that has always clicked with me the most. Um, I was never a big Street Fighter fan. I like Tekken a little bit. <laughs> I'm not very good at Tekken, but Mortal Kombat is the one of the one game franchises I am still very competitive in today. And in 1995, they put out a movie, which was... I don't want to... It's not the first video game movie, because Mario Brothers came before it. And I know Mario Brothers is often... Um, though it is the first video game movie, although I'm not sure if that's true because I don't have the facts in front of me, but, um, Mortal Kombat was the first one that was like successful and proved that, you know, this could be a thing. And, um, it wasn't like a huge runaway success. The movie did well for itself. Um, I'm trying to look up the box office right now as we speak, but, um, like in the grand scheme of things for the time and for 1995 and for something that had been pretty much unproven at the time, which I'm looking, it has a 34% on Rotten Tomatoes, which Rotten Tomatoes wasn't even a thing back then, but, uh, you know, they retroactively review stuff. Um, so on a budget of $18 million, it made $122 million, which is pretty big, especially for 1995. Um, and it's, it was a lot of fun for me as a fan um, as a kid, I, I didn't have a Super Nintendo. I didn't have a lot of arcades near me, but I did have interactions with, um, Mortal Kombat arcade cabinets and things like that. But for me, it was mostly the Sega Genesis version of the games. I had a Sega Genesis. I had Mortal Kombat. I had Mortal Kombat 2. Um, I, d- I think eventually had Mortal Kombat 3. But uh, for me, Mortal Kombat 2 was where it was at. And then later on, I uh, grew to love the first one just as much. But, um, you know, 3 and up, uh, I I love every Mortal Kombat game that's ever existed, even the bad ones, because there's things to appreciate about even games like Mythology, Sub-Zero, and what was that Jack Special Forces game? I've never even seen that one. But um, still keeping my fingers crossed for a new Shaolin Monk-style Mortal Kombat game. That is something I would love to fucking do. Um... But, uh, so when the movie came out, it was one of those things where like I had Mortal Kombat action figures. I played the games on Sega constantly. Um, I would draw pictures of the Mortal Kombat characters all the time. I, I loved drawing and that's what I would spend a lot of my time as a kid doing. And, uh, Mortal Kombat characters would often make their way into my drawings. I love the ninja characters. So I'd draw the ninjas and swap out the colors just like in the game. Um, My favorite character growing up was Reptile, who is still one of my favorites today. Although the way they kind of design that character nowadays, he's not one I play as as often, but still make an effort to give him a shot. And uh, lately, Johnny Cage is kind of like when I play Mortal Kombat 10, when I go online, it's Johnny Cage and Sub-Zero for me all day. Uh, Mortal Kombat 9 was Smoke, which... uh, he made an appearance in the second movie, not this movie, and I do have some scripts for the second movie. I need to 
dive into and see if they're worth covering because holy shit that movie is a shit show but um again it's it's bad but i still enjoy watching it in some aspects um very few aspects like the fight scenes only (laughs) um but uh mortal kombat the movie i remember it came out in 1995 i unfortunately never got to see it in theaters uh my best friend who lived a couple houses down from me at the time uh, he, he saw it and, you know, he came back telling me how awesome it is. And he was one of the people that kind of got me into games and Mortal Kombat to begin with. Um, and we would play together and, you know, beat the shit out of each other on the game. And he was always way better than me. And, you know, nowadays I kind that's how I am with a lot of my other friends is I'm the one that comes in really hard <laughs> and everybody has to fucking try to stand up to me. Um, but I, I, you know, I just, I, was so jealous that he got to see it and I didn't and I didn't get to see it until it eventually came out on VHS and we rented it and from our local like grocery store they rented out movies and I watched it at home for the first time and I fucking loved that movie <laughs> and uh, I still watch it a lot to this day um, when I rank video game movies because I I'm the type of person I love video games I love movies I love video game movies even the bad ones um, Like, I may hate the movie, but I still love the fact that it's a thing. Um, Mortal Kombat is still my favorite video game movie. Um, There are ones that are better. Like, technically, I would say Assassin's Creed is probably the best made video game movie. But, you know, most people wouldn't agree with me. Uh, For the longest time, I think Tomb Raider was the uh, video game movie that had made the most money at the box office. I think it was eventually beat by Prince of Persia, which as far as I know, might still be the biggest one, uh, released theatrically. But, um, to me, Mortal Kombat is the best. It is is my number one. Assassin's Creed would be my number two at this point. I actually really like that movie. And, uh, Silent Hill would be my number three. So there's my top three video game movies. Um, and hopefully, uh, there are more I want to cover on this podcast. Hopefully I can track some script. I, I have some scripts uh already and we will there's one i've been reading that i will cover soon but i wanted mortal Kombat to be the first one that i wanted to cover because first of all it's a movie i knew like almost front to back and it was easy to just blast through the script and notice the differences um and what i'm actually going to be looking at today is the first draft of the mortal Kombat movie now i don't know if i still have this let's see um according to and i believe this is the same according to uh wikipedia the credited screenwriter is kevin droney droney we're gonna go droney (laughs) um and he he you know turned in his draft and things get rewritten and i don't know who actually did the rewrites i actually have multiple drafts of this script and i would like to read all of them at some point and like maybe i'll do an episode i think there's like two more Maybe I'll do an episode later and uh, just compare the two drafts to the original. Because what I will say from this first draft, um, it it follows the beats of the movie. Like, the movie is here. Um, you read this script, and if you know the movie at all, all of the scenes are there. It's pretty much in the same order of the movie. It's just all these little details, and sometimes big details, are very different throughout the script. Um, Now, the movie ended up being directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, who is somebody I would give an arm and a leg to have a conversation with and open an honest conversation because I have some words for this guy. Uh, Because he's made some movies I really love, such as Mortal Kombat. I love his movie Soldier, uh, Event Horizon. And then he's made things like the Resident Evil movies and produced things like the Dead or Alive movie. And I would just love... To have a conversation with this guy where I can get some honest answers and be like, just what happened? Where? What were you thinking? What were you doing? But I'd also like to talk about the things I like. Like, even his Pompeii movie I watched recently, there are some good things to that movie, even though it's not a good movie overall. I did still enjoy aspects of it. Um, but yeah, so he he directed Mortal Kombat. And I, I want to say that might have been one of his first uh, big movies that he had directed. I think he did some short film work before then. Um, yeah, so I see he did something called Shopping, which I think was a short film. Uh, no, actually, no, that was uh, his first movie. So he did a movie called Shopping. He did a short film called EICID, which is a television crime drama thing. I don't know what that is. Um, and then he did Mortal Kombat. So Mortal Kombat was like the movie that put him on the map. And ever since then, he's been deeply tied in with 
like video game movies and nerd culture. Like he did the Alien versus Predator movie and Death Race and the Three Musketeers and you know things like that. Like he's kind of had a pretty consistent career as far as the projects he's been involved with. But um, Mortal Kombat was one that he will. I think in the end, I people will probably argue the Resident Evil franchise. So I think he'd be more favorably remembered for the Mortal Kombat movie. But I mean, if you if you think I'm wrong. Uh, let me know. Um, but let's get into the movie. So, Mortal Kombat. If you've seen the movie, th- like, and I would recommend watching the movie uh, before this. Um, it it follows. It's all the same, like plot wise, and like the flow of scenes is all the same. So we open up with the fight scene on the uh, at the temple with Shang Tsung and Chan, Liu Kang's brother. And the thing I will say about the first draft of the script is everything is the same, but more expanded. For example, we learn a lot more of what was going on that led to the fight with Shang Tsung and Chan, which in the movie, it's like it opens up with the dream sequence from Liu Kang. And there's like no there's talking in it like he says, your brother's soul is mine and steals a soul. That part is kind of absent from the script. There's no talking And we actually see this dream sequence way more throughout the script than we do in the actual movie. I think in the actual movie, we see it twice. Um, But uh, we actually learn like what there was actually basically there was a scene that they made leading to like what led to that fight. And that was completely cut out of the movie. And that's a lot of what this like reading this draft, you get a good impression of what can happen to a movie like there are things that make more sense to me now from the movie that either were cut from the movie or never even filmed uh because they were in the script um and so f- the opening scene is is the same it is uh you know the the fight scene Liu Kang wakes up from the dream and we see that uh he needs to come home and um all the dialogue in the movie is different. Like there are some of the classic lines you may remember are still there. Um, but they, they definitely make a point to let you know that Liu Kang is from Chicago, which is, I mean, kind of cool being from Chicago, but they name drop Chicago so much in the script and talk about how he moved to Chicago. He's watching too much TV in Chicago, his apartment in Chicago. Like they fucking hammer it into you. And it just felt weird. Like, why are they trying so hard to tell us where Liu Kang lived? Like, it was actually coming off a little like forced. Um, so the opening scene with Johnny Cage, like, so we get our we int- our introduction to our three characters, just like in the movie. Um, Johnny Cage is basically the same, um, except uh, there's just more dialogue. Uh, we his him and his sensei they talk more, and none of the dialogue is really very good. So I didn't feel the need to highlight any of it here but that scene they just kind of it goes on a little longer some extra dialogue uh just talking about the tournament and how it's how it's a big secret tournament he's like well if it's secret how do people find out about it and they just kind of brush that off um the sonya scene is actually pretty different um if you remember in the movie when they introduced sonya it's kano and shang Tsung hanging out in some room and there's like it's in a maybe a warehouse but a big area where like a concert is going on and sonya and her crew are just kind of like making their way through the crowd headbutting people and hitting them with rifles and one guy jumps out and gets shot and then she's like hey where's Kano uh in this it's different um the room scene is kind of the same uh Shang Tsung and Kano are in a room they're talking and he's like you know you need to lead Sonya to the tournament another thing this script does that's very different from the movie is they put a lot of emphasis on Shang Tsung and Sonya um it's it's implied that from the beginning he has it planned to face Sonya at the end because he knows that would lead to his victory versus in the movie. It's something, and I think the movie does it a much better job. It just kind of seems like an opportunity that presents itself that he takes advantage of versus in this script. There's a lot of interactions with Shang Tsung and Sonya where he's smiling at her, dropping weird dialogue hints, kind of like hinting that something's going to be up with those two and it just it seems like a little too much and i think it worked off way better in the actual movie um to me that was the preferred method um so yeah and in the, in the script this scene is a little different there it's like i said the, the scene in the room is the same but um and there's no like concert 
thing. It's just a warehouse. It's just a plain, bland warehouse. And it's actually a little bit longer of an action scene. It describes her and her special forces team when Jack's like kind of moving through this warehouse, taking a bunch of guys down and then kind of the same, like leading to one guy who's, you know, she's like, where is Kano? Um, and I kind of like the concert moment in the movie, but this is actually a scene I could have seen. It could have been swapped out for either one. And I think still would have been enjoyable. Um, it's a, it gives a little more action to the movie. So this is a scene it, for me, it could have gone either way and it would have been fine. Um, so moving on, we get Liu Kang going back home. And uh, so this we learn more about why Chan was fighting Shang Tsung. That basically Shang Tsung appeared at the Temple of Light and was saying that he was a traveling warrior who wanted to, you know, learn from the monks. And he was also going to be fighting in Mortal Kombat because one of the differences in this is they really emphasize that. 50 people from Earth are going to be fighting in the tournament. And we'll, we'll get into more of that later, but there's a lot more people that get a bit of a spotlight in the movie aside from just the three main characters. Um, but yeah, so basically Shang Tsung showed up at the temple and was posing as just like a weary traveler or something like that. And he wanted to spar with Chan. So they had like a sparring match, but then obviously the sparring match turned into a fight for his life that Chan lost. And... The idea is that Shang Tsung came here and lured him out, uh, or killed Chan to lure Liu Kang to the tournament. There's also, if you know your Mortal Kombat lore, which any super fan like me should know this. Um, so Liu Kang is the descendant of the original Kung Lao, which they have a line in the movie, I am Liu Kang, descendant of Kung Lao, I challenge you to Mortal Kombat. Um, there was a lot more talk about this in the script. Now... The original story for Mortal Kombat is, um, as they said, you know, Mortal, they have to win 10 tournaments before they can, you know, enter the realm. In the video game, it might not be 10 tournaments. It might just be the one. I can't remember. Um, they might have incorporated that from the movie later on. Uh, but the idea was um, 500 years ago, Shang Tsung was uh, ruling the tournament and he was defeated by kung lao who was a warrior of the temple of order of the light and kung lao was the new champion and then kung lao remained victorious for years i think like 10 years or some shit like that and then eventually uh while shang Tsung was banished by shao khan to the minds of shokan god i am really showing my nerd card right now <laughs> um the, he was banned of the mines he met goro and that's where he brought prince goro the four-armed brute to the tournament who's half dragon according to the video game and he defeated kung lao and became the new champion of mortal Kombat. because at this like while shang Tsung is goro's like uh leader i guess for lack of a better word um goro is the champion of mortal Kombat, and they, they say it in the movie you know you can face the reigning champion prince goro uh so in this script there's a lot more talk and reference to uh, Liu Kang being Kung Lao's descendant and it's why Liu Kang was always destined to win the tournament because he is related to the person who won it before and it's it has been foretold and things like that there's a lot more of that in the script um, so while if you remember in the movie this is also our first time we meet Raiden which Raiden played by Christopher Lambert in the movie who is fantastic like I it was like always kind of disappointing that like, oh, Raiden doesn't fight in the movie, but they made sense of it of he is a god. And I think in the video games, the storyline was he had given up his godly uh, powers and right to fight in the tournament as a mortal, which is cool. But I love the way that he plays the mentor role in the movie and the, the script. He is obviously the same character. But if you if you watch the movie, the dialogue and Christopher Lambert, he has all of the memorable lines in the movie. He's such a great character and he's like really fucking snarky and laughs at them and like the fate of billions will depend on you. <laughs> Sorry. And like he laughs at him and apologize, like stuff like that. And his dialogue in this script is terrible. Like all of it, like most of the dialogue in the movie is really bad, but there are scenes that did make it or lines that did make it into the movie. But if you remember the first appearance of Raiden is, uh, the, you know, Liu Kang has been given the dream. He will, Okay, which was a line I never understood. Liu Kang has been given the dream. He is the chosen one. 
the dream they're talking about is the dream about Shang Tsung, and that's never really referenced in the movie. I mean, I guess you could put that together. I never did in like the 30,000 times I've seen that movie. But again, there's a lot more talk and reference about his dream. So in that scene, you're like, oh, that's that's kind of the sign and symbol that he is the chosen one and has to go to the tournament. Um, and so when Liu Kang's giving his speech, you just hear Raiden's voice. And that's why you left the temple and ran away, isn't it? That sounds like a really evil Raiden. And, you know, when I do these solo shows, I do a little bit of voice work and they're not all going to be winners. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's his line of dialogue. That's why you left the temple and ran away. And, uh, you know, he approaches, everybody bows and, um, uh, I can't, I can't remember the rest of the line, but basically he's like, you know, being the chosen one was too much, but vengeance, that's something so much simpler. This is completely different. And I'm going to read this dialogue and Raiden is just such a different character. So here's Liu Kang's dialogue. Send the blood descendant of the last great champion of the Order of Light. I promise that I... It says, suddenly a voice like thunder booms into the temple, cutting Liu off. And then Raiden's first dialogue in the movie. Promise nothing, you braying jackass. It's... What? (laughs) Um, And then so everyone turns to find a large figure standing in the doorway... A coolie hat keeps his face in shadow. His clothing is in rags, his feet bare. He carries only a simple wooden staff. The imposing figure approaches. You come to the temple dressed like a department store dummy, spraying pronouncements around like sacred flame around the sacred flame like donkey spit. And says mocking tone, I remember everything. Cause Liu Kang had a line where he said he remembers everything that they had taught him and that's why he came back. But, like, yeah, the dialogue for Raiden, like, I, I understand what they were going for, and clearly in the future drafts, they they fucking nailed it, because when they actually finally got to Raiden as Raiden, he was a much better character. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's really bad. The dialogue for Raiden is extremely laughable up until the point where they're on the boat, um, which, speaking of the boat, let's get there. So everybody's going to the boat. Um, there's a lot more emphasis on human characters. Like there's actually another named human character that talks shit to Johnny Cage about how he's a fraud and stuff like that before he meets Art Lean, who's the uh, black bald guy who ends up dying to Goro in the movie. Um, and Art actually has a few more lines and stuff in the script. Like it actually seems like they wanted to have more human characters than just the three, which I think is fine, um, especially since you need people to care for that are meant to die, which Art kind of fills that role in the movie otherwise none of the main characters are ever in that serious of danger um but yeah so on the boat scene like we have johnny cage has an assistant named nancy that he has some expanded dialogue on that she ends up not really being anything in the movie um the the suitcase scene is super racist where so if you remember in the movie um Liu Kang's just walking by and Johnny Cage is like hey you know when the boat comes in you want to put these on board and he's like you want me to carry your luggage he's like yeah I pay money you carry the bags and this is like way more racist so the thing is when he's getting his suitcase out of the limo uh, his assistant had already hired a bunch of people who work there which they're in uh, China I believe so it's a lot of Chinese people, you know, they sh- they take the luggage because she paid them to. And so when Lou is walking by, he's assuming that he's one of these guys because he is just Chinese. And then he there's a like a super racist line of dialogue and him putting on a super racist accent. And it's just like, oh, groan. And, you know, it kind of plays out the same where Lou takes the suitcase. But then as he's walking on the boat, turns and throws it off and blah, blah, blah. It's it's just it's so much better the way they changed it in the movie where it's just like, hey, I'm just going to pay this random guy to dump my luggage. It was a really poorly written scene and clearly a first draft attempt at humor. And it was very bad, which there is a lot of attempted humor in this early script. Johnny Cage is I mean, as he is in the movie, he's way more led to be like the comic relief character, except when he needs to be serious. Um, And it, it does kind of conflict sometimes in the tones. Um, so Sonia, um, if you remember in the movie, her and Jax are just kind of sitting there watching the docks and then she sees Kano and runs after him. And this is a little different. This, it's a actually full on chase scene, which is actually in some of the Mortal Kombat comics is there's a, 
the way she gets lured onto the boat is they literally have she's like chasing him in a jeep and he runs onto the boat as if he's escaping but he's escaping to where he actually needs to be um yeah so now we got all the three characters on the boat and the boat scene was one of my favorite scenes in the movie and in this it's a little different um so johnny actually gets knocked down by kano and sonia as kano gets on the boat and then they go looking for him like they do in the movie uh, they go into the hold where instead of, like, if you remember, they come to the door and it opens and Scorpion and Sub-Zero step out and then awesome fucking music plays because the music in that movie is fucking awesome. Like, I love the music in Mortal Kombat. The score is so good. Um, But before that, in this, the captain comes out and he punches Johnny Cage and Sonya takes the captain out. And then Sub-Zero appears and blows her gun by and with breaking on it and then Lou I'm sorry I totally fucked up that sentence Sub-Zero uses breath to freeze things a lot in the script and he like blows on Sonya's gun to freeze it which I don't know how he blows through a mask but they honestly never even say that he's wearing a mask in this but um yeah so it's just like a little different like he he blows on the gun and it freezes then it breaks and then Liu Kang takes him out and says, chill out, because of course you need that shitty fucking pun. And then Scorpion appears, and that's when Raiden interferes, um, which the dialogue in this scene, they actually name drop the Emperor, which I don't remember recall them doing in the actual movie. I think they just refer to him as the Emperor, but in this, they straight up call him Shao Kahn. I don't think they actually do that in the movie. Um, so yeah, uh, the, when the, the heroes we'll say uh they return to the deck of the boat and the captain has to deal with shang sung and shang sung shows off a little bit of his magic kano's in his cabin and the captain's like i'm sorry i didn't mean to let them in and uh, shang sung turns him into a rat and then turns himself into a giant cobra and eats the captain which is unnecessary but sure you know show off a little bit of his magic we talk about how shang sung is a sorcerer but in the movie you don't really see a lot of that except for when he steals people's souls Okay, so now we get to the scene where they are coming to the island, and I have in my notes, man, Christopher Lambert crushes Raiden, and this version just sucks, which is so true. Um, one thing that bugs me is Liu Kang saw Raiden personally turn into lightning and still questions his beliefs when they're on the deck of the boat. Like, it's it's the old fucking, you are the chosen one, like, we're going to Mortal Kombat, this is a fantastical island, and... Liu Kang is still like, well, wait, wait, wait. I don't know if any of this stuff is true yet. Like, still don't know if you're a Raiden when you literally saw him turn into lightning. And it's it's a little inconsistent with the characters. Um, I definitely think they made that make more sense in the movie. Whereas it makes sense for Sonya and uh, Johnny to keep questioning things. But Liu Kang, he's, he's smart enough. He knows at this point. Um, so one thing that's a little different, they get to the island and when everybody's kind of flocking in, they, there's the robed monks that are there all throughout the movie. They actually try talking to one of them and they take their, uh, hood off and you actually see all their mouths are sewn shut, which is, you know, adding a little more to the world than we do in the movie. And Johnny actually has a good line where he asks them, how do they eat? Which is, uh, I enjoyed that. Um, So when they, you know, they climb the scene in the movie, they climb up the stairs and then we get into the courtyard with all the statues. Um, They see a statue of Kung Lao and Liu Kang calls it out. You know, this was my ancestor, blah, 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 which again, it's interesting. It's cool. You know, they're paying tribute to the history of Mortal Kombat, um, something that the movie doesn't do a lot of, but, you know, will touch on from time to time. Um, We also have the Katana scene where... Everybody sees Katana, and Sonya in this version calls her a bimbo, so that's a little different. Um, They do point out a statue of Goro, which kind of kills the Goro reveal, uh, which is pointed out by Johnny. They don't really say who it is, but, you know, they point out the statue, and it is described in the script as clearly Goro. Um, So we next go to a scene that's not in the movie, which is their living quarters. Like, everybody... Like, in the movie, it's just kind of implied that everybody just, hey, you hang out on the island wherever you want, you sleep wherever you want. In this, they all have living quarters, and all the quarters are perfectly designed to represent each character. Like, um, they actually say Liu Kang's looks exactly like his Chicago apartment, because they have to shout out Chicago every time they can. 
I wonder if the screenwriter is from Chicago. Like, I really wonder what's going on with that. Um, so, you know, Johnny has kind of a lavish, like, movie star type place. And Sonia has, like, a bare bones uh, facility almost with, like, a punching bag. And, you know, they get a scene where she goes into her... Because she just wants to find Kano. But she goes into her place and, like, actually smells herself. And is like, oh, I kind of fucking stink. And then she goes and takes a shower. Um, so, you know, we get to see a little bit more of the island. And the fact that they actually have places that... Um, they're going to be sleeping in um, the one they actually has some good humor here because the whole time Johnny Cage is uh, complaining about the boat and the water and being seasick and stuff and he's like you know a lot of emphasis on being on dry land and then when he finally goes into his place and lays on his bed it's a water bed and he's just like oh like he can't win and I actually I laughed while reading that I thought that was really funny <laughs> um, the, there there was like a good running joke throughout the beginning of the script um okay so one thing that is actually interesting to mention is so the next scene is the uh the big banquet scene which in the movie is where they demonstrate um sub-zero's powers and when he freezes that guy in the demonstration which is a great scene great music as i said the music in that movie is amazing um in this version they actually name drop jade and jade is in the script um there's also a bunch of strange like monsters at the banquet which the monsters they actually call barakas and they're like cat-like creatures so they they name drop them as barakas but they are nowhere near as close to what barakas should be they don't have the claws or anything like that it's just like a thing they pulled from the game um and yeah there's you know we see art lean and johnny they kind of have a conversation here um he name drops this is better than wrestlemania which was hey that's kind of fun um and then in this version we actually see goro is watching the banquet from the balcony but uh nobody really seems to it's it's not like a oh he's like looming over everybody it's kind of, if you remember in the movie when they leave the banquet and they're um going to look for shang sung like goro's hand is watching from the shadows like on a gate you see his hand it's kind of the equivalent except this time he's watching from a balcony (coughs) excuse me um yeah so in this version sonya actually confronts shang sung and asks about kano um and the ninjas appears you know scorpion and sub-zero and you know he kind of brushes them off and Shang Tsung kind of talks to Sonya like he's got a big thing for her. And again, a lot of emphasis on she is important to him for some reason. Um, but then, you know, Shang walks away and now Lou follow, decides he's going to follow him. And that this is, you know, like in the movie where they're following him and, um, you know, this leads him to Goro's lair. It's kind of the same thing. Uh, we, we definitely get multiple allusions to reptile, but no introduction like we do in the movie. Like when they're in the statue room and Shang Tsung is like, watch them carefully, reptile. Keep them away from these humans. And reptile was disguised as a statue and then he runs off. That's not here. And this we just get a lot of hints of like, oh, there's something invisible that's been following them. Excuse me as I break for water. Um, yeah, so we get a couple of allusions to Reptile here, kind of the same. They're walking through the caves and spits acid on Lou's face or whatever, which I guess that's what that was supposed to be in the movie. Um, he just kind of blows something on his face, but and in this, apparently it's acid that's just not strong enough to burn him. Um, so yeah, they go to the, uh, Goro's throne room and the conversation he's having with, uh, um, Kano is kind of the same, but then a ridiculous scene is they, like, bring in food for goro and it's like a living animal and goro's like chasing it all over the cave and like running and jumping and crawling on the walls with his forearms and meant to show his agility which we would never see in the movie (laughs) um and it's like a ridiculous thing i actually really liked goro in the movie like the costume might look a little ridiculous but i think it still holds up pretty well and is pretty entertaining nowadays um yeah so just like some massive exposition and backstory in this scene um instead of fighting soldiers they fight barack okay yeah sorry i'm reading my notes yeah so in the scene like so then when they get discovered that they're peeping on the throne room they try to leave and end up circling around back into the throne room is the same um and instead of fighting human soldiers they fight a bunch of barakas which is lame and the fact that they you know call these things barakas at all is dumb uh Oh, sorry, I gotta get comfortable here. 
do these by myself. I just like sprawl out, get comfy, just lay down. <laughs> um, but yeah. So, and again, Raiden saves them just like he does in the movie um, with some marble gag. I have it in my notes as marble marble gag that makes no sense. And it didn't. And I'm going to try to explain this, but basically it's like as they're fighting, like a bunch of Barakas appear and like an electrical marble, like a little ball rolls down the stairs and then like explodes or something but then rains that like i honestly couldn't even tell you um but that it was it's way better where he just holds up his finger and it's like there's some lightning and they all back off it made so much more sense to make it these like the red hooded guys that are in the movie who you assume are just like slaves of shang Tsung. like we didn't need these crazy creatures that are arbitrarily named after game characters um that don't resemble the character at all so <laughs> Another thing, the movie just handled way better. Um, so then we move on to the first day of the tournament. There are a lot more fights in the script. You don't actually see them. We don't follow them. But it's if you ever saw Dragon Ball um, and remember in the world tournament stuff where they had like preliminary bouts with multiple rings and people would just like fight. And there was like 17 rings in one area. It's basically described like that. Like we see a lot of people fighting just to get into the first round of the tournament and this is actually where the staff fights happen like if you remember the first fight in the movie is Liu Kang versus the guy that used to be on WMAC Masters and they have a fight with uh, the bow staffs uh, bamboo staffs and um, that's kind of that's the preliminary fight here it's not actually like a spotlighted fight like it is in the movie <coughs> another difference is we actually see uh, Katana fighting um in the pre pre uh, blah, blah, blah. preliminaries and um sonia ends up fighting jade who she beats and johnny fights the guy who mocked him at the boat so you know he gets to prove himself to that guy uh for some reason jade has katana's fans like again they're just pulling stuff from mortal Kombat games and just like arbitrarily handing it off to different characters and creatures in the movie and thank god like clearly somebody was made to go through who actually was a fan of this stuff and i know fighting games didn't really have much of a story to work on but there was enough there and the movie f at least did it correctly but the first draft of this script is kind of insane um so the first like big fight between main characters is johnny fights scorpion and scorpion uses two size like melina because literally, like I said, shit is just thrown all over the place. Um, it is a relatively uninteresting fight. It's just a fight on a stage and he beats him. Which you think in the movie, they're in that awesome forest area. And then they, you know, teleport into basically Scorpion's lair of hell, as we're led to believe. We, you know, it's never really touched on. But that's like one of the best fights in the movie. And in here, it's just a complete lazily described fight. Which, you know, f just... This is kind of a hard movie when with things like that because when you have it in a movie, you know, you got fight choreographers and stuff like that. A lot of times in a script, he'll just be like, oh, they fight, Johnny wins. And this is kind of one of those scripts where things aren't described super crazy, except when they have to be, like when Liu Kang fights Sub-Zero. So one thing, and this was one of the moments I said uh, it, it expanded on the movie for me. The temple that Liu Kang and Sub-Zero fight in is where Kung Lao had fought and won years ago. And that's a really cool thing. And they talk about Liu enters early and he's kind of exploring the temple. And um, it's they put a, just put a lot of emphasis on like, oh, Kung Lao fought here. And I love the way they tie that back. Um, now, the, again, the Scorpion, or I'm sorry, the Sub-Zero and Liu Kang fight is maybe one of the best fights in the movie. To me, it's uh, Reptile Liu Kang, Sub-Zero Liu Kang, and then Johnny Cage Scorpion, probably in that order. Um, but yeah, so in this version, Sub-Zero just breathes ice. He never throws it from his hand. And I think it's really lame that they just can't just keep to the games the way shit is if you're already making a mortal Kombat movie it's going to be ridiculous you don't need to fucking ground it in reality that way and it's kind of one of my problems with them as much as i love it that mortal Kombat rebirth short that was shot by the guy whose last name i'm never going to be able to pronounce but his first name's kevin so we'll call him kevin t 
because I believe his last name starts with, or is it, yeah, Kevin T. Um, yeah, he, you know, he did, um, he ended up doing Mortal Kombat Legacy, which I loved because Mortal Kombat Legacy, you know, while it is, um, different from like the movies and games, it doesn't take it too seriously versus Mortal Kombat Rebirth was like, what if we did Dark Knight, Batman, but Mortal Kombat, um, which is not how this should ever be done. Um, but yeah, so the Liu Kang Sub-Zero fight is actually much bigger in this. Uh, they end up burning that temple down. Um, Sub-Zero is actually burned into flames, but he ends up freezing it like he's basically immune to fire. And then, you know, the water scene happens as it does in the movie, which I love the ending to that fight. Uh, and their fight actually gets like a huge audience, which is way different from the movie because people, you know, they see the commotion in the tournament and um, or in the temple i'm sorry and uh, they want to come watch so you know just little different things happening it's like as i said the script is following the same path but just going a different way um so then we see the last fight of the day which is goro versus art um which for the most part happens as it is in um the movie except there's a, a little more emphasis on johnny watching goro fight and then when they get in their fight later it's something that comes up and, um, you know, he basically has Goro figured out, like, and that's why he's able to beat them. But their fight is way different in the script than it is in the movie. Uh, so we kind of end the first day with the death of art. Um, there's a couple more fights with some no name human characters that don't even matter. Uh, so then we get like a moment with Sonia and Johnny, uh, her in a kimono, he in a gi. And they talk about how Sony was, Sonya was actually engaged to her partner that Kano killed, which is something, as far as I know, has never been in Mortal Kombat before. It's just we've always known that um, Kano killed her partner, and that's why she's going after him. But um, in this version, they try to give it a little more depth, even though we've never met her partner. We don't know anything about him. So it's like, why do we care? Um, and that's kind of how that falls on me. Um that you know they kind of have their tender moment but then he says that he can beat goro and she like loses it and she makes fun of him um so our next big fight is sonya versus kano which i think happens way better in the movie like i love the way the movie kind of organizes the fights i think it all makes sense that way the one thing is you know she beats kano but then she doesn't kill him and just kind of like walks away and kano like basically lives and that's I, I think it was way better in the movie as just straight up revenge and you know that's how it was supposed to go. Um, well, and I'm sorry, I just had a technical difficulty because my recorder's batteries just died. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I'm not sure where it cut off there, but we're just gonna start with a quick rundown. Sonia fought Kano, didn't kill Kano this time, which, uh, as I, I, I man, I am, I don't know if it caught that part, but yeah, I, I thought that part was better in the movie where Sonya just gets straight up revenge on Kano instead of just letting him go. And honestly, we don't get resolution to Kano, so it hurts the movie in that way. Um, so Johnny Cage challenges Goro, which is what happens in the movie, but um, and then we all know that Shang Tsung reserves the right to challenge the winner or any one of his choosing. Um, which I, I love in the movie. I love it in the script. I love that idea. It makes more sense in this script though, because throughout the whole thing, uh, Shang Tsung has been making hints at Sonya. So we all kind of know where it's going to go versus in the movie. It, it comes out of nowhere. And well, it, it may make more sense in the script. I think it is better in the movie where it looks like Shang Tsung is taking advantage of a situation versus he's had this plan from the beginning. Um, both make sense because, you know, Shang Tsung would be that kind of guy. Um, but overall, it's 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 better in the movie. It flows better. Um, so Johnny fights Goro. And in this time, they fight on a bridge where the sun is hurting Goro's eyes. And he uses his son. Johnny Cage uses his sunglasses to <laughs> fucking uh, get a one up on Goro. And th- there's a lot more emphasis on the way Goro can maneuver because of his arms. He can climb on stuff. So there's like scenes where they're swinging under the bridge and fighting. It's honestly kind of, it's way more blown out than the movie, but it's really fucking ridiculous. And, um, I, 
I'm kind of of two minds about it because, like, one, it is cool to think of, like, it's a way we've never seen Goro before, but that's the thing. We've never seen Goro like that before, so we have no indication that he could move or maneuver like that. And he's a giant fucking one-ton guy. Like, he's not going to fucking fit, like, be able to swing on this bridge without breaking it. (coughs) Uh, Johnny also fights him with weapons and stuff like that. Um, but you know, in the end, uh, he uses lame acting to beat him, which I, I read this a little while ago from when I'm recording it. Cause I was kind of put off from work. I wish I could remember his lame acting, but basically instead of, you know, doing the splits and punching him in the dick, like he does in the movie, he basically acts dead and hurt and then like breaks his leg, which is, it's way more brutal. Like this is actually a good scene that shows Johnny Cage is, this fucking great fighter that he pretends not pretends to be, but the fact that he is actually this great fighter and the way he outsmarts Goro and he's actually really fucking crazy about it. And, um, he like breaks both of his legs and then breaks his arm. So he can't even fight. And then eventually Shang Tsung won't save him and he falls. And then this leads to what I think is a a pretty interesting portion of the script, um, and expands more on outworld. Um, but, this part of the movie is also my favorite part of the movie. So I have to go with the movie version on this. But, um, so Shang Tsung takes Sonya to outworld and, um, this version. So if you remember in the movie, there's basically the doorway that leads to the portal that leads them to outworld. And, um, in the movie or in the script, what actually happens is the Island is outworld. And there's basically like, um, not like a mirage, but, there's an illusion cast upon the island, and now that Shang Tsung has left, the illusion is disappearing. So Raiden is kind of getting all the surviving humans to the boats to get off the island, while Johnny Cage and Liu Kang remain back and basically disappear into Outworld. Like, they walk into a mist that is shrouding the island, and when they walk out of it, they are on the same island, but in Outworld. And, you know, it's kind of described exactly how it is in the movie, except... You know, there's, there's there's a big tower and there's the living forest. We actually see the living forest from Mortal Kombat 2 in Outworld. And if you remember in the movie, they're kind of just walking through, um, you know, I guess what looks like a destroyed town. And they come across Reptile, who Liu Kang throws in the statue. And for some reason, that statue has bad CGI living ropes that come out and absorb him into the statue. And he becomes human Reptile which is ridiculous and dumb, but leads to my favorite fight of the movie with my favorite song of the movie, uh, Control Instrumental by Juno Reactor, who Juno Reactor makes some amazing music and is perfect for this fight. And it's like the longest fight in the movie next to the Shang Tsung fight. And it's because like you go back and watch that movie, a lot of the fights are kind of like nothing, you know, it's we're, we're used to movies now where like post Matrix, we have these crazy Kung Fu fights and you watch making of videos like i remember when mortal kombat came out um they put it out with a animated movie called the journey begins which was basically um a telling of the portion of the story of when they're on the boat to when they first arrive on the island with a lot of repeated animation and uh um it was really cheesy and lame but i loved it i had it and it was like i didn't own mortal kombat but i own this animated movie that i got from a friend i could watch this over and over so I've seen it way more times than I should probably admit. But the on the back half, they had a making of featurette for the movie. And I remember it still sticks in my mind to this day of Paul W.S. Anderson talking about bringing, you know, Hong Kong martial arts to American movies. And there's not really a lot of that in this movie. Like the Matrix did that way better. And, you know, after he saw the Matrix, clearly he wanted to emulate that for the rest of his career. But um it's it's just crazy to think of like what passed for that then versus now and um you know it's just very different um so yeah Liu Kang actually fights reptile they don't even fight in this version they're in the living forest and reptile attacks him and they throw him into a tree and if you remember in mortal kombat the living forest is the tree or the faces on the trees that like yell at you and smoke and jade appear in the background uh, he throws him into one of the trees and the tree eats him so that's how reptile dies in this and it's it's ridiculous but it's kind of cool that it's in there and then um this is when katana appears um and she 
you know, kind of gives the same spiel to Liu Kang that um, she does in the movie and tells him about all of, you know, you must face your enemy, face yourself, blah, blah, blah. And, um, but in this, she talks about the trees and how she talks to them. And, you know, they tell very long, it's basically like the ends from Lord of the Rings. They take them a long time to talk and she's got thousands of years to listen. <laughs> um, so that whole, in this thing, it's, it's really, really lame. Um, we actually see a little bit of them sneaking into the castle versus uh, it just appears they they appear in the throne room. But like by a little bit, it is literally a little bit. It's like them approaching the castle and then they literally do just appear in the room. Um, so a big difference, if you remember the movie, uh, Shang Tsung and Liu Kang have their little spar and then Shang Tsung disappears and summons or he you know backs up and summons four different warriors that come out and attack Liu Kang and you know he takes them all down in two hits a piece watch the movie and count two hits a piece I promise you I promise you I wonder if I could be wrong but I promise you two hits a piece um, this is how fucking dirty I am about this movie uh, so yeah so the difference being in this version of the script he doesn't summon all of the warriors that attack him at once he actually turns into them all um, which is better it's how it should have been because shang sung turns into people that was like his main power in the video games and he does do that in the movie he turns into chan but and he does that as well here but i like the idea of him turning into these warriors and um i like it a little better um just because we get to show off that power more because in the movie we don't we don't get a lot of shang sung's powers um, but basically at this point, the movie kind of play or the script kind of plays out as the movie does, um, turns into Chan, uh, Liu Kang beats him, uh, more emphasis on the souls he has and how they're actually leaving him and he's losing power, which leads more to Liu Kang being able to defeat him as easily as easily as he does. But nothing in the script is described as good as it is in the movie. Um, I love the ending of this movie and the final fight between him and Liu Kang, I think is really fun and the pit. Um, I also don't remember if it actually ends in like a pit scenario. If like the spikes come out of the ground. Um, I believe that is how it ends. Cause you gotta have that pit in there. But um, yeah, it's basically from this point on, it's, it's what you remember from the movie. Um, one big change is the ending. So it's like, cause if you remember what I said, they um are they lo um outworld is the island and they were basically transported there so what it's kind of a weird thing that happens um it's they kind of just teleport back onto the beach and then they get on the boats with raiden um and i i believe that comes from the light that actually if you remember the uh, when Shang Tsung dies in the movie, um, the beam of light shoots out into the air, and um, they you know that's where all the souls come out. Sorry, I'm trying to like look it up in the script as I'm talking about it, just because like as I said before, it's been a little while since I read this. Um, okay, yeah. So the main, so there actually is no pit. Sorry, I went back and looked at the script. Um, there actually is no pit. Um, basically, as they're fighting, there's like these gates in the tower that they're fighting in, and there's like dark cloud behind it, basically. And as Shang Tsung is losing the souls, he's telling Liu Kang that he should kill him and take his power, which I guess that's how it works. And um, Liu doesn't do it, and then this these gates burst open, and this darkness comes out and envelops Shang Tsung. And that's how he dies. There actually is no pit, which I, I think the version in the movie is way better. Um, and uh, this darkness ends up taking, taking over the whole tower as uh, they escape. Um, and they end up running down to the beach, and uh, they basically kind of just right off the beach into the water where they're getting picked up by Raiden. And that's pretty much it. Um, Lou asks Katana to go with her or with him. I'm sorry. And she doesn't want to, um, she, you know, she has more to do. She's gonna, she's gonna stay back. Uh, she has her own path as they say. Um, yeah. And then it just, uh, 
it does end in kind of a uh, cheesy way um, where we show Liu Kang back at his village. Um, and we see uh, Johnny and Sonya kind of go off on their own. And then um, we it's just like Liu Kang showing them his village where they go up to where this the sacred fire is, which is basically the place where Chan died, I believe, is there's like a fire there. And it just kind of ends. Um, a really plain, flat ending. Um, I greatly prefer the hangout. Okay, so in the video game canon, um, when Liu Kang and them, they, they win the tournament, the whole thing with the second tournament is, because they're supposed to wait 10 years for the next one, is since Shang Tsung lost, um, they basically lure they so they send the Barakas, the Tarkadans, to attack the Temple of the Order of Light while they're there, and that lures them to Outworld, where they have a second tournament. And since they came of their own accord, they are allowed to have the second tournament, and it's not breaking the rules. So I like the idea of in the movie we get the tease of Shao Kahn, even though he looks nothing like Shao Kahn in the sequel at the end of the movie. Um, and this it just has like a flat, you know, happy ending, and that's it. Uh, versus the movie, you know, it gets what would actually lead to Mortal Kombat two, and then they just ruined it by making Mortal Kombat Annihilation. But we're not going to talk about that. Um, but yeah, that's that's Mortal Kombat. Um, the first draft of the movie is real rocky. Uh, the dialogue is, for the most part, really terrible. I could have screenshotted some dialogue and read it as I had before. I, you know, I did a couple of the Raiden lines, but honestly, I would have had to start reading this entire script. Um, you know, even the dialogue in the actual movie isn't fantastic, but um, it is. It's still an enjoyable movie. It's cheesy when it needs to be cheesy. It's fun when it needs to be fun. It has heart when it needs heart. And the script is just kind of like a little all over the place. It follows the same path, so it's not completely terrible. Like looking, you can look at this draft and look at the movie, and you're like, okay, I see how they got there. But um, overall, the first draft is you know what a first draft usually is. It's kind of shit. Um, the, a lot of it comes from really bad dialogue and the reworking of the plot really works more in the movie, and in a way stays more true to the games to the point where the games actually borrowed stuff from the movie to expand on their lore, which I guess is what led to a lawsuit that tied up the rights for the movies post annihilation. Um, where a guy, I guess the guy who ever made, I've always heard the story that the guy who made annihilation basically is like, I created all the story for this. Like I own the story and, um, he's the one that's kind of tied up making another movie for a long time. I don't know if that's true, but that's the story I've heard. That's for all I know, that could be true. But um I I do plan on looking at the Annihilation script I have. I plan on looking at the subsequent drafts of Mortal Kombat that I have, but I doubt there's any reason to talk about that stuff on the podcast given the fact that we know how the movie came out and any drafts are just making it closer from this draft to what the actual movie is. So maybe we'll look at some of that. Maybe we won't. Um, but that was, that was mortal Kombat. I, I hope you enjoyed it. I could talk about mortal Kombat all day. I think this podcast is actually relatively short for what, even with the technical difficulties involved, it's relatively short for how much I could sit here and talk about mortal Kombat. And if you want to talk anything about mortal Kombat, uh, let me know. I actually have, the TV series, the live action TV series that ran on TNT, like after WCW Nitro, um, which was a great fucking show, Mortal Kombat Conquest. They never released it in America on DVD. And then they finally did put out a US release on Amazon that you could get for $10. And they like don't even sell that anymore. Um, it's really hard to find. So if you want to find it, you'd have to probably go to eBay. But I got it. I got it signed by wrestler Ming, actually, because he was in an episode of the show because it was after Monday Nitro. So they had a couple of wrestlers in the show. Um, I It's it's really cheesy. It's really bad. Um, the three main characters, uh, one, the guy who plays, it actually takes place like in the 500 years ago when Kung Lao beat Shang Tsung and blah, blah, blah. And it only ran one season and was actually a good ratings hit. And for some reason, they just never made a second season and never got... It wasn't like, oh, you're canceled. Your show's terrible. It's just like, they're like, no, we're just not going to make one. And 
always questioned it because it was a, su- a successful show and I I thought it was fun. It's definitely has like some dumb moments. Like anytime there's uh like up close fighting or like anytime there's like hand to hand fighting that involves like people throwing punches and being blocks, they always did like an extreme close up and would even like repeat some of those in the same fight of them doing the same hand patterns. Like it had its cheesiness, but and like all the characters would like, oh, we're about to fight, so let's jump into this room that's like a perfect empty square, and all the floors are clearly soft mats, and it had those things, but it was still really fun to watch, and I still love it. Um, and it actually incorporated a lot of characters. They even got Noob Cybot in there, which was interesting. But um, it was a fun show. It actually had an interesting story going on with Shang Tsung and Kung Lao, and the actor who played Raiden was actually really good, and he actually played Shao Kahn, and. The show ends on the mother of all cliffhangers and they just never did another season. Like the show ends with all of the main characters getting killed and Raiden becoming Shao Kahn's servant, which is like, what the fuck? And I guess the whole idea with the second season was they were going to be like, oh, Shao Kahn broke the rules. So everything that he did gets reversed by the Elder Gods, Um, but they never got around to it. So the show just ends like that and it's fucking crazy. But uh, and there's also a cartoon uh, Defenders of the Realm, which is bad but fun you know if you love mortal Kombat, all of this stuff is worth watching um i think quan chi actually debuted in the tv series conquest and i actually thought he was a great part of the show so i highly recommend if you can get your hands on conquest it's worthwhile i think it's only like 22 episodes or something like that um kristana loken was one of the main characters who was the female terminator in terminator 3 and then the agent that fights um lawrence fishburne on top of the semi and the matrix reloaded was the other main character and then some asian actor who played kung lao who i don't know but he he was pretty good in the show and he's I, he was i think he was clearly chosen for his fighting ability i think he does most of his own fighting but which i think most of them did and you know some of the characters or actors who were in the original movie were actually in the show like the actor who played scorpion in the movie plays scorpion in the show except he has like a his transformation into the who Scorpion is is way different. It's it's kind of like Gotham where, um, you know, it's it's like this is Batman, but it, things don't happen in this show the way they happen in Batman. It's kind of the same thing. This is Mortal Kombat, but we don't get there the same way. <laughs> um, but now I'm just rambling about Mortal Kombat Conquest. But I, I will want to talk more about Mortal Kombat. So if you have any thoughts about it, send, send them my way. I want to hear about it. You can... Email us at shelledfilmpodcast at gmail.com. Answer any questions, talk about any comments, any discussion. You want to hear my opinions on anything Mortal Kombat? I am more than happy to talk about that. Um, If you want to yell at me for my Justice League review, feel free to do that too. Or if you have a different Justice League review, that seems to be one of my more popular downloaded episodes recently. So Um, I'll talk Justice League with you some more. I got more to say about it if you want to hear it. uh, yeah, and you can also contact us at Twitter at Shelved Podcast. Same with Instagram. I'm trying to post on there more. I'm not posting enough on Instagram, but at Shelved Podcast on Instagram. Uh, be sure to hit us up on all those social medias. And you know what? I haven't said this in a while, but uh, be sure to leave us an iTunes review. Just go to iTunes. Leave us five stars if you like the show. Leave us one star if you think we're that bad. I want to hear it. Like I want to hear all of the criticism. I would love a five star review from you. But if all you want to give me is a one star and tell me where to shove it, I will gladly read and listen to that as well. Um, I, I want to hear anything that anyone has to say. Uh, I love hearing from the audience. Everybody who you know follows me and contacts me on Twitter and YouTube, I love talking to all of you guys and gals. Um, but yeah, that's all I got for today's episode. That was Mortal Kombat. Thank you for listening. Be sure to check out all those social medias. Check out that iTunes review page. Leave us a review. And we are going to be back. Um, So originally I was planning on doing Devil May Cry for the next episode. um, But I kind of got bored of reading that script. So I'm going to put that one off. That'll probably be the one after the next one. Which again, really busy at work. Working 75 hour (laughs) work weeks. I am exhausted. I am recording this way later than I was supposed to. On so I'm literally recording this like minutes before it's going to go up. So uh, sorry about that. I am trying to get these out, but I'm literally working like 75, 80 hour work weeks right now. And I'm a little exhausted. So I'm trying to get them through. But the next episode, 
not going to be Devil May Cry. That's going to be a couple episodes from now. The next one is going to be a little different. Um, the next episode, we're going to talk about RoboCop 2. And this is actually RoboCop 2, the comic book, based on Frank Miller's original draft for the RoboCop 2 movie. Um, Robo, uh, Frank Miller wrote, he has writing credit on the RoboCop 2 movie because they did take some of his script for the movie. They took enough of it to give him writing credit, but his version was very different. And, um, I have the comic book and I've been reading it. If you want to read that, you can find the comic book, Frank Miller's RoboCop. It's on Comixology. If you want to read it digitally, comicsology.com, um, which is a great, great site. You can actually read it right off of their website. So if you don't normally read a lot of digital comics you don't know how to read digital comics you can actually read it off their site and that'll work perfectly for you um but yeah so that's going to be the next episode i've already halfway through reading it i have a lot of notes for it um i love robocop it's another childhood staple of mine that i will talk about when uh, we get there but um that's going to be it for today's episode so and that'll be what we're going to talk about on next week's episode followed by devil may cry followed by i'm not sure what else yet but you'll be sure to be updated so that's going to be it thanks for listening and be sure to come back for robocop 2 on our next episode